church, let's give him praise in this place. Jesus, the name above all names. Lord, we want to thank you today. As we've already said, we are here to celebrate the fact that you've risen from the dead. You're alive forevermore. You're exalted on the throne in heaven. Your name is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and even under the earth. And Lord, whilst we live this life, we know it is but for a short time. But on beyond this life, we will spend eternity in your presence, in a place prepared by you for us. Lord, we want to thank you that, Lord, beyond this life, we look forward to ever praising you, ever exalting you, ever knowing you, Lord, as Lord. And there will be, Lord, times in eternity whereby, Lord, we cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord who was and who is and who is to come. Lord, we just want to thank you as your people today that you have chosen us, that you did despise us, but you chose us to be your very own. And Lord, what a life this is that you have given to us. We do not take it for granted. Lord, again afresh, I pray that you would visit our hearts to truly understand and appreciate the wonderful work of your Holy Spirit in our lives, especially in this Christmas season. Lord Jesus, that we would praise you, and thank you, and know that you are near, that you never leave us or forsake us. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus another praise in this place. And then you can be seated. Let's thank our musicians. I say it every week, but you know what? These guys are such an amazing blessing to us. And on Friday night, wow, Friday night, we had our black tie ball for the young people. Who was there on Friday night? Any youngsters? Yeah, a couple of them. But you know what? We've got an amazing team in this church men and women serving our young people. It was a joy. We had a big dance. Dean and the team were up here, and Michelle, and Neil and Allison, and Andy and Siobhan, and a host hall of other people, Nathan Wood, all up here having a little jive. And I thought, you know what? It's wonderful to see people laying down their lives for others, especially our children, Tony and Lara, week in, week out, serving our young people. It's, it's a joy, isn't it, just to see others laying down their lives for a younger generation. So we should give them honor, and I know Dean's going to uh, tell us a little bit about that next week uh, when they're here back from Bradford. So yeah, let's give Jesus thanks for what he's doing among us. It really is. And let's never take it for granted. Never take the house of God and the family of God for granted. Let's always be thankful for the family that God has placed us in. For the, for the brother and the sister that sits next to you, let's never take one another for granted. But give thanks to God that he's drawn us from all of our many very different places in life into this home. You know, some people are very critical about the church and critical about the family of God. I'm telling you now, the church of Jesus Christ is prized by God. It's, it's the only thing that God has promised to build. It's the only thing that has value to God in that he's building it on this earth. So we must always prize it, value it, and give thanks for it. Amen? Well, a few weeks ago, we started looking at um, Luke chapter 1, and we saw how Mary and Joseph, on that first moment, that first encounter, that first Christmas as we know it, had to embrace huge changes in their lives. You know, when you live this life of faith, very often you have to embrace change. We looked at that. Last week we saw that they had to overcome rejection. 
Change is part of the Christmas message. Overcoming rejection is part of the Christmas message. Today, we're going to look at another aspect, another message that comes out of this first Christmas scene. And it's in one word, encapsulated in one word, and it's this, trust. Trust. When you look at that first scene of Christmas, all those thousands of years ago where Jesus came into our world, it's a scene of complete and utter trust. If there's one word that hangs over Mary's life and Joseph's life, it's this word of trust. Trusting God, believing what God has said in the face of contrary circumstance, in the face of tremendous pressure, in the face of when everything is going wrong and nothing's going right, they trusted God. They believed God. Maybe when you look over this last past year, it's been a year of difficulty, a, di a year of trial, a year of misunderstanding. Oh, there may have been some moments where things have gone well, but there's been some hard, difficult times that you haven't understood, that you, you, you couldn't put your head round, that's confused you, and yet in your heart, you've walked through those difficulties, you've walked through those times of trial as a result of trust, Trusting what God has said over the trials that you face. Trusting God over what the pressure of the moment has placed you in. Trusting God when you don't know what to do or where to go. Today, as we look at this, this story again, what we're going to see is this wonderful heart faith, this wonderful heart element called trust. Trust. We looked at Luke chapter 1, and it's the moment where the angel Gabriel comes to Mary in Nazareth, and he pronounces God's favor on her life. God's favor came to Mary in a very unfavorable place, Nazareth, the place that had a reputation of nothing good ever coming out of it. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. It's an unfavorable place. It's an unfavorable environment. It's an unfavorable surrounding that Mary has grown up under. She's heard all of the pronouncements over the lives that were living in Nazareth. No great expectation for anything new to begin. No great, you know, prospect for the future. She's living in a dead-end place. It's amazing where God will visit. It's amazing where God will go when he wants to select somebody to use. Just think back to where he went to when he found you. It was a Nazareth place. It was a dead-end place. It was a place, really, that was going nowhere. And God was willing to come into that dead-end place of our lives and pronounced his favor on us just like he did for Mary in that city called Nazareth. He brought favor. The angel of God, Gabriel, pronounced favor on this woman in a very unfavorable place. God will do that. In fact, the Bible says, Paul said it in Ephesians. He said that when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you can't get any more dead end than that. You were dead. Your life was stinking just like mine. And yet God was willing to come down into that dead end place through his spirit, by his son, and bring us up into newness of life. That's favor. That's acceptance. That's favor in an unfavorable place, church. The same miracle. The same miracle of this wonderful favor exploding in Mary's life in an unfavorable place exploded in your life the moment that you accepted Jesus into your heart. According to Paul in Ephesians, dead in our trespasses and sins and then we get visited by God. We put our faith and our trust and our hope in a new word to create our world and suddenly 
we take him from that unfavorable place of death and we're raised into newness of life in Christ Jesus. Mary hears a word of great favor. You're favored by God. Highly favored by God. Go home and read it. Understand the scene. Understand the encounter. Understand the message and the word of God that comes into his spirit. Everything around you may be contradicting what God is speaking to you. Everything about your life may stand up and say, that can't be true. But the moment that you say, I'm the servant of the Lord, be it done unto me according to your word, something happens. Something changes. And this is what happened to Mary. Luke chapter 1, verse 38 is Mary's response to the angel. After the angel had pronounced this great favor, after the angel had explained that the Savior of the world would be conceived in her womb, after the angel had told her that she would be overshadowed by the Most High and that would make the impossible possible, at the end of it all, the response, the heart response of Mary was this. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Everything seemed so impossible. Everything seemed to contradict what God had spoken. But we are people of faith. We believe that God can do the impossible. And it doesn't matter what stands against you. It doesn't matter what stands up and says, this can't be done, this won't be done. Your future is set. It's just going to be a rerun of your past. You're never going to leave this dead-end place. You're in an unfavorable place. You can't be favored by God. Well, I'm telling you now, that voice hasn't taken into account that all things are possible to those that believe. That voice, that accusing voice that wants to keep you down and hold you back hasn't taken into account that nothing is impossible to God. God can do it. The, the, the same power that overshadowed Mary can overshadow your life and do things that you would never thought or believed. It really can. This is the message of Christmas. Overcoming change, moving through rejection, and trusting God when everything contradicts what God has said. I wonder what word you're believing for. I wonder what word is hidden in your heart like was hidden in Mary's. And circumstance contradicts it and even people contradict it. And even your own soul wars against the word that is settled in your spirit. But it's still lodged there and it's still simmering and burning within you. And it doesn't even matter if your mind collides with it. It doesn't even matter if your, if your soul wars against it. That word is in your heart. And it's sent for a purpose to accomplish that for which God has sent it and designed it. This scene where Mary for the first time comes into contact with the living word of God for her life is a scene not only of great favor from God, but it is a scene of heart surrender. You know, if you're going to trust God, we've got to be willing to surrender. That involves surrendering our, surrendering our rights. That involves surrendering the way that we want things to be done. It's hard stuff. It's not easy. It involves surrendering our plans. It involves personal sacrifice many times. And that's why it's difficult to trust God. Mary had been planning her wedding. They were betrothed as good as married. And all of, the, all of the preparations and the plans had been set. 
And then suddenly the Word of God comes into her world. And the plans and the purposes of God cut right across the direction that her life is heading in. And it's a moment of decision. It's a moment of choice. A moment of surrender and personal sacrifice. And do you know what? The moment that she said, Hey, listen, I'm your servant. That's when her life as she knew it came to an end. This is the story. This is the faith and the trust that we find in this young woman on the first Christmas when Jesus Christ came into our world. Probably the greatest, I would say, hero of faith in the Bible is not a man but a woman. And all the women said. I mean, what compares to this? You can read about many exploits of faith, and I don't think the Bible compares them. But you know what? If you were to put it all on the table and, and, and draw comparisons as to the faith of this woman against others, this must stand alone, apart from every other. And she was so young. She was at the beginning of her life. You know, you ask young people, don't you? What do you want to do with your life? And they've got this huge list. It's fantastic. That's good. They've got a, a whole host of dreams and ideals and desires where they want to go in life. That's good. Just like this woman must have had dreams and aspirations and desires for her life. She was going to get married to Joseph. They were going to start their life together and the family. Preparations were long underway. And then suddenly, in a moment, everything changed. You know, we get used to routine. We get used to, you know, format. We get, we get used to just living a certain way. All of us do. But suddenly the Word of God can just come and, and in a moment change everything. And we have to be, as God's people, open for that. When that still small voice comes into our world. And that is where we come to the crossroads. That is where we come to a point of decision as to whether we are going to surrender our dreams and our plans and our hopes and aspirations, whether we're going to sacrifice what we want for what God wants. That's the story of this young woman, a young woman who had plans, dreams, aspirations, hopes, and goals. And then God comes in a moment. She's faced with a choice. The angel leaves only when she says, I'm your servant. Be it done unto me according to what you've said. I've decided to align myself now with a new revelation, not with my reason. My reason says, I'm going to get married to Joseph. We're going to live in this location. We're going to, things are just going to work out for us like it does for everybody else. That's my reason. That's my plan. That's my, my goal for the future. And then suddenly the revelation of God breaks into her world. And she says, now I'm going to align myself with that. And she has to leave everything else open to God. Proverbs Chapter 3, verse 5 to 7 says this. And again, this whole scene at Christmas with Mary and Joseph and the others, this scripture epitomizes what happened in this whole event. Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 7 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths, 
Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And this whole scene of this first Christmas is an enactment of those very verses. Complete trust in the Lord. Just imagine if Mary had have leaned on her own understanding. The moment that Joseph turned to her and said, listen, I've got to put you away secretly because the law does not permit this situation to occur. According to, according to Old Testament law, you have to be stoned publicly. What is happening within your body is not acceptable to our laws and to our customs. And Joseph was, was considering putting Mary away and divorcing her. You see, the betrothal was as good as marriage. The marriage had taken place. It had just not been consummated. Joseph was considering to, to divorce her because the revelation of God did not line up with his reason. You can read about it in Matthew chapter 1. But you know, Mary, this woman of faith, this woman of trust, this woman of sacrifice, this woman who had surrendered her her life completely over to the will of God and what God wanted, not what she wanted. She doesn't respond negatively to Joseph. She doesn't try to explain. She doesn't turn on God. What if Mary had have leaned on her own understanding? God, when I accepted the fact that you were favoring me highly, I didn't think that that would mean rejection from Joseph. And Joseph was a good man. When you read about him, he wasn't there to shame her publicly. But there was a very real problem. Mary had a promise from God which left Joseph with a huge problem. You know, sometimes the promises of God can be burning in your heart. And those promises can create problems that you never foresaw. Those promises that you're holding on to can lead you into places that you never thought you would go. The promises of God, the promises of God can create huge problems. If you don't believe me, you just got to look at the life of Jesus. Jesus, on, on one occasion, talked about a sower sowing seed amongst the soil. And he said, he, 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 he typified that picture by, by this. He said, he said, when the seed is sown, it's sown into the human heart. And it's the Word of God going forth into the heart of men and women. And he categorized all, well, four different types of heart condition. But he said this. He said, when the seed was sown in one heart, because of the Word that was sown, persecution came. The promises of God, when they're sown in your heart, can actually bring about problems that you never foresaw. Persecution can come as a result of the Word of God. And this was the case for this young woman. The Word of God had been spoken into her heart. And now her world was quickly changing. Her relationships were all under question as a result of what was happening inside her but God, you see, took care of it. When we trust Him, when we don't try to explain and put things right, when we don't lean on our own understanding to work everything out, which is unworkable anyway, God takes care of the rest. Joseph gets a dream. And the angel speaks to him and assures him that it's okay for him to take Mary as his wife. God will look after it all. God will bring you through when you believe, when you trust, when you put your hope in him, just like he did for Mary. And Joseph understood that the Lord of the law was bigger than the law. 
And he received that word from the angel and he took her as his wife. And both of them together now are trusting in the Lord. They're not leaning on their understanding. If they'd have lent on their understanding, if they had dissected the word of God, the revelation of God that had been spoken to them with their reason, it wouldn't have even got off the ground. But no, they trusted God in the midst of all of the confusing elements that were around them and trying to attack them. Then they're on their way from Nazareth to Bethlehem, 100-mile journey, and then there's the whole confusion. There's nowhere for Mary to have this child to be born other than a dirty stable. Do you know, a few years ago, we went to Cumbran Community Farm, and they had a little nativity there. It was excellent. And, you know, the nice thing about that was, you know, you were going to see all of the real animals around the little nativity. It was really, really nice. But the smell, oh, my goodness. I'm not born to be a farmer, I tell you. The smell of it, the manure, the urine, all of it, just a smell, a stench. I mean, to bring a little baby into that is unthinkable. To, to, to bring your child into such a, a scene, what does that say? Does it say that God's no good at planning? The one that threw the stars into space, that created everything we know within our universe, does it say that God is no good at preparation. No preparation's been made. No planning, it would seem, has been made by God as the child, the Christ child, is born into a dirty stable and laid in a manger, an animal feeding trough. I mean, what kind of message is this? Everything seems to be conflicting with the word that she had received in that moment in Nazareth when the angel Gabriel came to her, highly favored, highly favored. Then why am I riding on a donkey a hundred miles from this dead-end place, Nazareth, and my child is being born in Bethlehem? That didn't have much better reputation. If you read Micah 5, it was the smallest, the most humblest of towns in all of the region. And yet the ruler that would be born from it would be great. Oh, the message of the kingdom, the message of God. The ways of God are seen so, so wonderfully in this first scene. God doesn't prepare a palace for Jesus to be born in. God doesn't need the power and the organizational skills of man. No, he, 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 his nature is to be in the hiddenness of a stable. His nature is to go among the lowly. His nature is to choose the weak elements of our world and not the powerful, not the strong. They weren't in the know. They weren't part of this first Christmas scene. And in the midst of all the conflict, in the midst of all the confusion, in the midst of everything standing up and saying, we don't want you here, Mary and Joseph just simply, quietly trusted God. When they could not trace him in their circumstances, they trusted him anyway. You, you look at Genesis chapter 3 or, Je or, or the, first, the first few chapters of Genesis and the amazing thing is that you see that man is created in God's image. But what's incomprehensible is that God was created in the likeness of sinful flesh, man's image. It's amazing to understand that God would create us in 
His image, but for God to be created in our image, that's a whole different ball game. But God comes into our world and He's willing to take on the likeness of sinful flesh and weakness in order to save us, in order to bring us into a new life with the Father. And that happened when Jesus was born in that stable, that dirty place. With nobody there but them and a few shepherds, everything seemed to conflict with the trust and the faith and the word that they were holding in their hearts. After Jesus had been born and was a little one, maybe 18 months, two years, there's another move that comes to them as the angel warns them about Herod's evil intent as he's murdering babies, tens of thousands of babies. And they're told to flee, to run to Egypt. When Mary was in Nazareth, hearing that she was highly favored by God, hearing that, that God had accepted her and blessed her above all women, the angel didn't tell her that she would be traveling five, over 500 miles to Egypt, running for their lives. But you see, I believe that God saw into the character of this young woman. God saw that she was the material that he needed. God saw that even as a young person, she had the tenacity to walk through trials. She had the tenacity and the strength to believe God when everything was contrary around her. She had the willingness to be sacrificial and to surrender everything by saying, I am your servant, Lord. Whatever this requires, whatever's ahead of me, I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to back up. I'm not ever going to accuse you or trouble you. I'm going to trust you. In all things, God knew that this young woman with her husband, Joseph, he knew that they had the necessary material to walk through all of the trials and all of the difficulties. When we're faced with things that conflict with what we're believing, when we're faced with situations that we're trusting God for, Let's hold on to that word. Maybe today, even in your body, the pain in your body or the condition that, that, that you've been diagnosed with is a direct contradiction to the word that God's put in your heart. You believe that he's the Lord that heals you, but your body's in pain. That's a contradiction. And you feel the tearing and you feel the anguish of that. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Take courage from this first scene. Take courage. Don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. God is good. He's going to do it for you. He's going to bring you through. Whether he uses the doctor or whether he uses me medicine, I don't know. Or whether he just does a direct miracle. Let's keep believing. Let's keep hoping. Or again, in your, in, in, in your mind, in your emotions, You believe that the joy of the Lord is your strength. But again, you get attacked by fear. Again, you get attacked by those heavy emotions, those depressive moods. You can't shake them free. It's like a black hole. There's no reason for it. And again, it comes and it sweeps over you. And it's a contradiction to what you're believing. You believe that you're more than a conqueror. You believe that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And yet you get you get cut down by all of these things in your emotions. And it's a contradiction to what your spirit believes. But keep holding on. Keep fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Just because circumstance is contradicting you, just because your emotions are raging in a certain way, contradicting the word of God that you're believing, that doesn't mean to say that you've lost your trust in God. 
That just means to say that the, that, that the enemy is afraid of who's inside you and he's opposing you. You can do it. You can make it. You can come on through. Just like, just like they did, we can. And that's why we look at this. We're not just looking at history. The Holy Spirit wants to encourage us that God can be there for us just like he was there for them. Trials come, trouble comes, but the Bible says that God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. And as he was an ever-present help for them in their time of trouble, I'm telling you, he's always been there for us, hasn't he? He really has. He's never let us down in our times of trouble. This is the message, part of the message of Christmas. It really is that we can trust him amidst the troubles of life. We can trust him when we can't trace him. We don't use circumstance as a lens to assess the goodness of God. God is good. Sometimes circumstances are bad, but even when God circumstances bad our assessment of God is that God you are good you're a good God you're a loving God you're the light that shines in darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it you're a good God and he's good to us irrespective of what's happening in our bodies what's happening in our minds what's happening in our souls I'm telling you now heaven applauds Heaven applauds the warriors of faith. And Jesus said, fight the good fight of faith. And you know like I do, you never come out of a fight with a, with, without a couple of black eyes, without a couple of scuffs, without a couple of cuts. But after it all, we can stand. Maybe with a few broken bits, but stand, having done all to stand, Paul says, remain standing. I'm going to ask the musicians to come. We're going to finish. In a few moments, let's give Jesus praise. Let's give Jesus praise. He is so kind to us. He is so good. David said, In Psalm 119, verse 5, Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. The word of God will always be a lamp unto the feet of the people of God and a light that shines on down that path. And it doesn't matter what trouble or trial or difficulty or circumstance tries to beset us on that path. It's a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, he says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We don't use our reason. We don't use our intellect to interpret the events that beset us, even though it wants to kick in even though it wants to make decisions above it all. And I'm not saying you throw your mind away, but when your mind is trying to hinder you and hold you back, that's when we trust in him. We walk by faith irrespective of what we see. And this we see so wonderfully in the life of Mary and Joseph. What they could see didn't line up what God, with, with what God said. Highly favored. Although God long before had told, foretold all of the trouble that was going to take place when the Christ child would be born. But what they, what they believed didn't line up. What they held on to didn't line up with the circumstances they faced, but they walked by faith nonetheless. Nonetheless. Today, maybe 
There's things ahead of you that you could be afraid of. Maybe presently, like we've said, within your soul, within your body, there are things that are trying to hold you back. And the Holy Spirit wants to encourage you. You're favored by God. You're favored by God. It doesn't matter if the place that you're at at the moment seems so unfavorable. You're favored by God. You are favored, beloved of God. And we place our faith and our trust in that. Lord, I pray right now for every person under the sound of my voice. Jesus, you know the trials, the difficulties, the troubles that sometimes afflict us as we walk out your word for our lives. I pray for strength. I pray, Lord, for an absolute surrender over to your word I pray, Holy Spirit, that we would be like Mary that would say, be it done unto me according to your word. And no matter what faces us, no matter what comes our way, I pray, Holy Spirit, that we would quietly follow what you've said to us and how you direct us and that we would come on through into everything that you have called us to do. Right now, Holy Spirit, I ask you, comfort your people, encourage your people, strengthen your people, lift any heavy heart, lift any burden that tries to hold us back or bring us down as we walk with you. In Jesus' name, I'm going to ask while our eyes are closed, are you here today? You've never asked Jesus into your heart. Maybe today, again, as you've sung the songs, as you've listened to God's word, you felt Jesus knocking on the door of your life. You see, he loves you so much. And Jesus wants to live in your heart by faith. You've just simply got to place your trust in him and maybe today you're here and you want to place your trust in Jesus he will lead you he will guide you he will never forsake you he'll be with you always and I'm going to give you an opportunity right now just to pray a prayer with me where you're going to place your faith and your trust just like Mary did in Jesus the Savior the one that lives forevermore this is going to change your life this prayer this trust that you place in him it's going to change you immediately the prince of peace is going to live in your heart the moment that you place your trust and faith in him you're going to receive peace in your heart the peace that you've been looking for searching for that you found nowhere you were to find in him if you want to pray while eyes are closed, if you want me to pray for you, I want you to quickly slip up your hand. I'll see it. And then you can put it down. Is there a person here? That's right. That's it. Don't be afraid. That's it, my love. That's it. That's it. That's it. You're just placing your faith in Jesus. Don't be afraid. Four people have lifted their hands up. Church, we're going to pray with these people, aren't we? We're going to pray. The same Jesus that lives in us is going to live in them. Is there another, another person here this morning? Life's been hard. Life's been difficult. Well, we know that's not going to change. But just imagine having Jesus, the King, inside you to overcome those trials and to comfort you amidst the difficulties that you face. I'm going to pray for these people. Let's say it together today. Just a simple prayer. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Be my Savior. I believe 
that you died on the cross, that you are alive forevermore. You rose from the dead, and I believe it. Now I ask you to live in my heart. I want a relationship with you. Not religion, but a relationship. I ask for your peace and your comfort right now. Amen.